Okay, um, so I'm Paul Bellow. I'm the token um, representative of the United States military. Um, please don't throw tomatoes. <coughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about moral machines in the military sphere. Um, and what I'm really, so if you were at yesterday's session on um, military robots, uh, I just wanted to go over the, the takeaways really quick because I, I don't think it's really even worth having an entire presentation about um, what, what these issues are. I wanted to save a lot of space for what I'm, you know, my program and my colleagues' programs are trying to do about them. Uh, so basically, there's a document called DOD Directive 3000.09. Um, it's a policy recommendation that just came out. That's not a recommendation. It is policy. It is our policy um, about the regulation of autonomous systems and drones. And um, there's an integrated roadmap for unmanned systems. <coughs> they all say roughly the same thing. There are no, there, we have no foreseeable plans to um, remove humans from, from the loop when it comes to uh, even uh, autonomy as it gets more advanced. Uh, so we realize that uh, these are really difficult problems. We really need to focus on rigorous testing and evaluation methodologies for these things. I think that's one area where um, there could be a lot of collaboration between members of this group and, um, and folks in the states. What I really want to emphasize is in terms of the amount of money being spent and, and the issues being explored, targeting is certainly not the end of the discussion. We're not particularly interested in, in putting guns on, um, on flying things and shooting people from the air without humans being involved. I don't even think it should be the focus um, because the military does so many other things. So we do disaster relief, we do first responding, we do search and rescue, we do surveillance. We do medical uh, robotics, or we're involved in that area. Um, and most of our investments, at least certainly most of my investments, uh, are in those areas. So I feel just as home being a program officer for the National Science Foundation as I do for the Navy. Um, and just reading, so I read the, the, um, the EU COG kind of foundational document, and a lot of what, what's in there is exactly the kind of stuff that, that we fund. Um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about dystopia and making sort of futuristic predictions, but I, I think personally, and I think this was echoed to some degree um, in Professor Prescott's talk yesterday, we really need to start moving past discussions about whether we ought to build such things because such things already exist, and, or at least in part already exist, and we really need to talk about um, how we should build them, what kind of functionality they should have such that we can minimize um, the kind of negative impacts, or at least foreseeable negative impacts, they might have. Uh, and also, in the same session yesterday on military robotics, Professor Whitby uh, mentioned that dumb autonomy uh, is, is potentially dangerous autonomy. And I, and I think that's, that's right. Um, I don't think that's right in all cases. I think there are cases where having dumb autonomy is just fine. But the cases that I think are most interesting and compelling for us are cases involving machines that closely interact with human beings. And once you're in a space uh, where you're closely interacting with human beings, uh, things really open up. So you have to have machines that are genuinely social. Um, and this is what I see my job to be. So my job is sort of making autonomy less dumb, making investments to make autonomy less dumb, um, and making interactions with humans more fluent and safer. So just sort of, I'll talk a little bit about the kinds of investments that I make, uh, my program, its long-term objectives. I'll show you some some sort of token movies um, on the back of Sonny's presentation, which I thought was excellent. And uh, it, so it's funny, I just wrote a, I just wrote a paper, well, I actually got quoted in Defense News Daily saying exactly the same things. You know, AI is sort of all about what stinks. And you know, anything that actually works just becomes, it sort of goes away. It's, uh, it's a tough burden to bear if you're an AI researcher. So um, what am I really interested in? I'm interested in the development of uh, certain kinds of cognitive architectures that um, integrate inference over everything from sensor data all the way up to sort of chunky plans that, uh, that you would find in classical AI. With a special emphasis on social cognition, I'll explain kind of what I mean by that or I'll show you some examples. Um, so the programmatic foci are really in language understanding and natural language dialogue, fluent and in situated interactions. Um, my personal research interests are in mental state reasoning, um, having machines that understand that 
other people and other machines might have different perspectives on the world than it does, uh, and being able to reason from those perspectives. Moral judgment, um, and of course there's endless ap military applications, so we'd like to train um, using avatars and AIs and um, smart robots. So synthetic teammates and human-robot interaction and certainly decision support tools that know a little bit of something about its user and what the user might want and need and so forth. Um, that's typically where recommend recommendation systems uh, don't do a very good job. So the special focus uh, of my program, I think, is in mental state attribution. What we're really interested in is developing interfaces that are what I'll call cognitively compatible, and I think that'll become clearer as the presentation uh, goes on. But I suppose what I'm saying here is that you need these sorts of interfaces to, um, to do the sorts of things that you see on the right. So you need a cognitively compatible interface to do serious natural language dialogue, to understand gestures, to learn in the same kinds of ways that, that we learn and as quickly as we learn, to infer intentions and to do moral cognition and eventually to uh, develop trust. And of course, all of these things require, <coughs> and you know, I'm happy to take questions offline, I don't think I have time here, but um, I could certainly make the linkage here between any one of those things in the, in the bottom right-hand corner and representing and reasoning about the mental states of team, teammates, adversaries, and others. You need to, that's a skill that you need to be able to do and need to be able to do richly and seriously uh, if you plan on doing anything um, in, the, in the lower right-hand corner. So we have to have robots that can reason about the humans that they interact with and possibly even about the humans and their perspectives of them and so on and so forth. Of course, there are some limits to how far we nest, but um, um, it certainly doesn't need to be some sort of an infinite nesting. So agents need to be able to reason about the perspectives of other agents. Here's a case. Uh, this, is, this is work done by Matthias Scheutz in the crowd. He gave uh, his talk yesterday. Oh. These are two robots um, tracking one another's mental states. Drone, what are you doing? Commander, I am not doing anything. Okay, transport, are you at Alpha yet? No, Commander, I do not have a goal to be at Alpha. Should I have one? Mental yes. state inference. Alpha. Okay. Drone, follow transport. Okay. Transport needs to know that it's going to Alpha by overhearing the conversation. So these are fairly simplistic models of, um, of mental states for agents, but um, the stuff that I'm really interested in and a lot of my personal work has been modeling um, uh, kind of the rough underbelly of what it means for an agent to believe something. So here's, uh, here's an interesting case. I've just produced a computational model, uh, I guess late last year, practicing what one preaches. So <clears throat> I'll just read this in case you can't see it. Many Caucasians in academia profess that all races are equal intelligence. Juliet, let's suppose, is one such person, a Caucasian-American philosophy professor. She has perhaps studied the issue more than most. She's critically examined the literature on racial differences in intelligence, and she finds the case for racial equality compelling. She's prepared to argue coherently, sincerely, and vehemently for the equality of intelligence and has argued the point repeatedly in the past. And yet Juliet is systematically racist in most of her spontaneous reactions, her unguarded behavior, and her judgments about particular cases. When she gazes out on class the first day of each term, she can't help but, but think that some students look brighter than others, and to her the black students never look bright. Juliet could, be, could even be perfectly aware of these facts about herself. She could aspire to reform. Self-deception could be largely absent. We can imagine that sometimes Juliet deliberately strives to overcome her bias in particular cases, she sometimes tries to interpret black students' comments especially generously, but it's impossible to constantly maintain such self-conscious vigilance. So based on your observations of what I just said, her words and deeds, what do you think that she believes? Does she really believe that the races are of equal intelligence, or do you not? Um, if you're an African-American student in Juliet's class, what do you think she believes? Would you trust her? Um, 
So this is an interesting case of kind of in-between believing. It's not really clear that she believes something truly or falsely. It's sort of a bit ambiguous. Um, and I suspect a lot of our beliefs look like that at some level or another. And the only reason that I present this um, is because <laughs> this is sort of part of, part of the model. This is just sort of a visualization of some of the model that, that I built. Forget what it means. The point is it's, it's not you know, just a sort of simple logical operator or something like that. It's, it's quite complicated. Um, and the point of the talk is to say that if we're really going to do the things that we'd like to do, uh, getting machines to be moral, we have to be serious about what it means for agents to believe things or to intend things or to desire things. And it's not nearly the kind of simple treatment that uh, AI has given these matters in the past. Uh, so here's some other work that I'm supporting in uh, intention recognition. Right. So you'll see down here, this is just a task network. Um, this represents sort of a, an eating task and making the table, uh, setting the table and cleaning the table. And you see there, um, well, it might be hard to see given the light, but um, <coughs> the robot is, or the camera is tracking the person, is tracking the relevant objects. Um, things are arranged in a hierarchy here, so you, know, you don't get to an eat action uh, before you get food and, and so on and so forth. So, We have, uh, we have machines that are at least tracking simple kinds of intentions. I mean, we're not talking about the kinds of intentionality you might reference in um, a fairly complicated ethical scenario, but um, it's a start. Um, so what do we hear about most on the news? We hear about autonomous systems and um, machine ethics and drones and so forth. Uh, is the drone program legal, ethical, and wise? Uh, so all of these interesting headlines. I just Right now, there's, there's no autonomous systems quite like this. I mean, there, there are people with joysticks doing these sorts of things. They're, they're drones only in sort of the weakest sense, I guess. Um, my claim, I made it at the beginning, I'll reiterate it now, is that moral considerations are pervasive in military operations. They're not just limited to uh, issues of privacy and lethal force. Um, just for example, these are pictures from DARPA's robotic challenge. Um, they're trying to get um, humanoid robots into disaster zones like Fukushima, for example, where there's been a nuclear meltdown. Uh, and the challenges are, are substantial there. I mean, getting a robot to walk over rough terrain is hard enough. Getting a robot to walk over rough terrain with tools in its hands, you know, uh, trying to fix pipes, well, that's a totally uh, different story. Um, this is Krang. I'll show you Krang in a minute. That's a, that's a very interesting story. Um, in the bottom left hand, I'm involved in a, a fairly large project building a robotic firefighter um, for shipboard fires, uh, which tend to cost millions upon millions upon millions of dollars and lost time. Um, and uh, we're trying to uh, do something about that as well. And of course, there's um, a brand new, you know, huge amounts of business in healthcare robotics. So this is um, Krang. Krang is, um, well, just going back really quick. So what's Krang doing? Krang is rescuing, rescuing his creator from an, an HVAC or a, a heating unit that's falling on, fallen on top of uh, him. And Krang knows, for whatever it's worth, that it can't use its own arms to pick up the unit and, and fling it because it has a model of its own internal dynamics. So what Krang it's learns it's to... Shooting. <laughs> <laughs> it's shooting him? It's no, no, uh, the pipe is smoking, um, but it's not shooting him. This is just a, pi this is just a pipe. <laughs> Um, it's, there's no explosives involved. Um, <coughs> so what Krang has to learn to do is to look for objects in, environment, uh, in its environment that it can use as simple machines. So it learns that, um, or it discovers that the pipe is strong enough to use as a lever um, to, help, to help it fling the, the thing off of. So we've actually had our first demonstration. This is the guy that was under, underneath the... Sorry about the cheesy music.
just in the interest of time, he ends up opening the prying the door open. Um, almost done. Just two more slides. So <coughs> the problem is, even in situations like that, which don't look like they're particularly morally problematic, um, there is an element of danger. There are human lives at risk. And you can imagine a search and rescue situation where a robot gets set in, sent into a, an environment like this, and it hears some screaming coming from over there and some screaming coming from over there. Communications have been cut off from, from a chain of command, and it's got to make a decision about who it ought to rescue. It knows it has some capability to carry X amount of pounds or X amount of kilograms. And um, well, well, how do you value human life? And in a situation like that, once, you're, one, once you've completed the mission and come out and you're, you've briefed your superior, um, you expect to be blamed because sort of people died or people were, were seriously injured. And then you have to, f you know, the robot has to have a sophisticated enough model of, of blame to understand blame from the perspective of, of the superior and um, maybe from the perspective of the person's family and so on and so forth. So um, a lot of what I'm funding now is um, <coughs> really looking hard at moral concepts. So this is a, a model of blame. Can't go into any of the details. Um, and uh, this is about 10 years worth of empirical work that's been condensed into a simple process diagram. But this is roughly the steps that people go through in order um, when they're faced with these sorts of situations. The more general point is to do this right, um, you have to have really sophisticated models of the beliefs, desires, intentions, and obligations of other agents. Um, you have to seriously be able to do counterfactual reasoning, which is something that um, automated systems have been um, not particularly good at doing. And um, actually, there's, some, there's sort of uh, some evidence that these two things are, are deeply related. Um, there's some really interesting <coughs> So forgetting drones, looking at search and rescue and these, and these, other, sorts of, uh, these other sorts of morally charged scenarios, issues of negligence. Um, we're building a robot right now that's going to go look at dials uh, and make sure that's going to do maintenance inspections. It's going to look at dials and make sure that their settings are correct. Well, what if it misperceives a setting um, and then the boiler room blows up and it hurts somebody? And we can trace it back to the robot not doing its job. So it was negligent. And, um, the robot's got to understand that <coughs> if it doesn't take extra pains to be careful um, or to do, to do a good job. And I know it sounds silly to talk about a robot taking extra pains, but if the robot's used for 20 different tasks and it's got to make, you know, it's got to make a decision about what to devote cycles to, well, these sorts of models become very important. And so, you know, in summary, um, this is the sort of research we're supporting. The study of moral cognition, machine ethics is highly multidisciplinary. You folks are the folks on the cutting edge, moral psychologists, social neuroscientists, developmental psychologists, experimental philosophers, ethicists, um, AI people. It's, uh, it's really tough. It, we speak different languages, but if we want to solve these problems, um, we're going to have to work together. And we, um, you know, we deeply need to work together. So I think that's about it. And um, happy to give it over to uh, Peter.